Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Mark Coker. Hi Mark. Hi Joanna. Oh, it's it's so good to have you back on the show after I think it's been five years. So it's been a while. I know it's crazy. Just a little introduction, just in case anyone doesn't know Mark. Uh, Mark is the founder and CEO of Smashwords, and also an author, speaker, and angel investor. And today we're going to do a bit of a state of the indie nation type of thing. Um, but Mark, I wanted to first, um, you know, we met in in person in Australia like five years ago, and that seems forever in the publishing landscape and, and Smashwords was reasonably new. So I wonder, just give us an, a sort of update. What's going on with Smashwords? What has changed since 2010? Well, I think in 2010, we were doing about 5,000 books at Smashwords. Right. Um, maybe 10,000 in, at in, that time. In, the, in total? Yeah, in total. Today, we're publishing over 360,000 books, working with over 100,000 authors and small independent presses around the world. So a lot has happened in the, in the last few years. And do you think that, I mean, do you think that represents the growth of self-publishing in general in the last five years? Yeah, I think that's a good indicator for how quickly self-publishing has grown. There was a lot of pent-up demand, um, hundreds of thousands of authors around the world eager to get published, who couldn't work with the traditional publishing system. And so we just saw this torrent of books coming onto the market, you know, thanks to platforms like Smashwords and thanks to the ebook retailers opening up their stores to self-published authors. Mm. And, and back, back then, uh, was it just Amazon? I mean, you know, Smashwords obviously has a retail side, but, you know, what did it look like then compared to now? Um, you know, back back then, Amazon was was still the largest player in eBooks. You know, in early 2010, Amazon controlled about 90% of the eBook market. Um, that's declined quite a bit um, thanks to the success of um, Apple iBooks, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, um, and, and other smaller retailers. So Amazon's market share today for eBooks is probably around. 60, 65% where it's been for a couple of years, but down quite a bit from those days where it controlled everything. Yeah, which is fascinating. And what do you think about the maturity of authors and things like cover design? You know, have you, have you seen a real change in the way that indies are? Oh, d definitely. You know, when, when indies first came to market, um, you know, from my perspective, eight years ago, we launched Smashwords almost eight years ago. Um, there wasn't really any guidebook for how to self-publish an ebook, and um, you know, a lot of the first indies were, um, you know, just experimenting with different things. When you look at what indies are doing today, um, indies are just so much more sophisticated, so much more professional, so much smarter about uh, ebook publishing best practices, and we see that in the cover design, we see that in the quality of the work, uh, we see that in the sophistication of the promotion and the marketing. Mm. And what about the stigma? Because again, when you and I talked, you know, back in 2010, there still really was a issue with being self-published. Uh, has that completely gone or where is the shift there? Well, it's not completely gone. So, you know, seven, eight years ago, self-publishing was the option of last resort for authors. It was seen as the option for failed authors. And, and that was really the reality of the situation because the authors who were self-publishing then uh, typically were not doing it by choice. They were doing it because they had been rejected by the publishers. And, you know, back when the publishers controlled the publishing industry, if they rejected you, you were a failure. So that's where everything was, you know, seven, eight years ago. Um, but what we've seen is that, you know, many indies, and, and I have just enormous respect for those very first indies who entered the scene, and you were among the first as well, um, who really believed in themselves. And it wasn't about vanity, it was about believing in yourself and, and wanting to have a chance to be judged by your readers. And so um, a lot of those indies took, took the leap despite the stigma and achieved commercial success. And with each commercial success for each indie, it helped really educate um, all other authors that, yes, you can publish with pride, professionalism, and success as an indie author. And so when we look at the, the state of the stigma today, um, the stigma um, has declined uh, markedly. Um, I, th I think that most authors still aspire to traditionally publish, but 
that that number that percentage is declining every single year um, and now it's really easy to find indie authors who are indie by choice mm -hmm. in, and first time authors who aspire to be an indie author and then you look at authors in the indie community they self-identify as an indie author. They wear it as a badge of pride. And so we've seen this amazing reversal. Um, at the same time that the stigma of self-publishing has declined, uh, we've seen the stigma of traditional publishing increase, I think. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're probably just a couple years away from more authors aspiring to indie publish than to traditionally publish. Amazing. And I, yeah. I, I mean... And I can see that too. I mean, I'm a proud indie and um, I know you are. And actually, I wonder, um, many people might not realize your own story. Um, you know, many people start a company um, because they think there's, you know, there's, there's money in it, which is a good thing. But you're an author, right? Just tell right. us about why you started Smashwords way back when it really wasn't trendy to be an indie. <laughs> it was all a fantastic mistake. <laughs> um, uh, about 14 years ago, I met my future wife, Leslie Ann, and she is a former reporter for Soap Opera Weekly magazine here in the States. Her job was to go to the sets of the Hollywood soap operas and interview the actors and actresses. So when I met her, she was telling me these stories about how the actors and actresses were more crazy in person in real life than they were in front of the camera. And if, for anyone who's ever watched an American soap opera, you know that that'd be pretty amazing to be more crazy than the storylines there. I suggested that she write a book about her experiences, and she said, well, why don't we write the book together? And, and I'd always dreamed of writing a book. I just never thought it would be about soap operas. And so I took a sabbatical from my company, and, and we spent a few years researching and writing this novel, BoobTube. Um, we were fortunate enough to get represented by one of the top literary agencies in New York City, Distel and Goderich. Um, and for two years, they tried to sell the novel to all the major publishers of commercial women's fiction, and they couldn't sell it. Um, the feedback um, that our agent told us he got from the publishers was that previous novels that targeted soap opera fans hadn't performed well in the marketplace. So they were reluctant to take a chance on what was not a hot category. Um, and so, you know, we were left with the option to either give up, like most authors did at that time, this mm -hmm. is 10 years ago, or, you know, we had the option to self-publish. In fact, our agent suggested we self-publish. But self-publishing seemed unsatisfying to me. Um, you know, self-publishing in print has been around for over 30 years. Um, but I knew that if we couldn't get our book into bookstores, we weren't going to reach very many readers. And I had no interest in filling up my garage and the trunk of my car with a bunch of unsold novels. Um, and so I thought about, you know, could there be a different way to do this? And I realized that, you know, despite all the, the talent and, and best intentions of publishers, they're in the business of selling books, not publishing books. And they need to acquire books that have the greatest commercial potential. So they're judging books through this myopic prism of commercial potential. And I was thinking, you know, books are more valuable than that. And, and even if my book has a potential commercial market of one reader, if it can satisfy that one reader, it's worth publishing. And I thought, you know, you know this was, you know, again, 10, 12 years ago when I came up with the idea, um, blogging had come on the scene in a really big way. And that was inspirational to me because blogging represented the democratization of writing and the democratization of publishing. And so I thought, well, maybe there's an opportunity to do what's happening in blogging in book publishing. And then I thought, well, what if I could make it possible for any writer in the world to self-publish a book, to control all the rights, to be able to do it at no cost to the writer, no risk to the writer, and let readers judge the writer? And that was the, the radical idea, this radical belief that Every writer in the world deserves to become a published author if they want. And so that's what we launched in 2008. And um, it's been an amazing journey ever since. You know, it, a lot of our authors have gone on to become USA Today bestsellers and New York Times bestsellers. Uh, we've got thousands of authors who are supplementing their, month, their monthly income with self-publishing. And, and many, many more writers who don't sell well, but they're still gaining you know, enormous satisfaction 
mm. from their self-publishing journey. Because as writers know, there's a joy in writing that can't be measured by your commercial success. There's a joy in total creative control, a joy in publication, a joy in communicating directly with your readers, hearing directly from your readers. Um, and so, you know, this movement, it, it is a movement. It's a worldwide cultural movement, this indie author movement, and it's here to stay and it's going to transform publishing for the better. Mm, and it's lovely to hear your origin story. And, you know, I, I think that indie is a movement too, and not just in writing. I mean, look at indie film, indie music, we've got right. the, the maker movement, we've got even things like farmers markets, I think, are in the same movement. It's a move away from supermarkets to buying from a farmer, away from a big publisher, buying from a creative, you know, I, it really is a movement. And uh, more like podcasting, this is not a commercial radio show, uh, right. you know, but we're still self published audio as such so I'm really excited too and we think similarly in many ways so I, I did want to just go through some of the big things that are happening right now um, and get your take so one of the things that we've seen in the last week or so is Hugh Howie and Joe Comrath some of the big names in indie coming out and going yay KDP Select 2.0 is amazing um, look at all the money we're making and um, I'm uh, multi-platform focused as of course you are because um, you're smart Smash words, but mm -hmm. um, I am because uh, last, you know, we've seen this before, right? KDP 1.0, everyone was like, yay, look at all the money and then KU apocalypse. So what are your thoughts, uh, you know, assuming that you and I are both biased, <laughs> yeah. what are your thoughts on the KDP 2.0 and, you know, what should authors be looking out for? Well, you know, I am biased, you know, a big mission here at Smashwords is to promote, um, a thriving and diverse ecosystem of multiple retailers, multiple buying options, multiple selling options for for authors, and um, so you know specifically, you know, for for folks who aren't um, don't don't understand the distinctions at, at Amazon, you know, I think Amazon is the smartest player in the business. Every author should have their book at Amazon through the KDP platform, but there are two options in KDP. There's the regular KDP, which every author should participate in, and then there's KDP Select, which requires exclusivity. And I've written about this quite a bit since they first launched KDP Select. I think KDP Select is toxic to the future of publishing. Mm. I think every book that goes into KDP Select is a vote to put all the other retailers out of business. And I know authors aren't thinking this way. You know, authors are, are rightly seen an opportunity to sell more books at Amazon. Authors who put their books in KDP Select will sell more books at Amazon. The system is designed mm -hmm. that way. And authors who don't go exclusive to Amazon will be punished by Amazon. Um, Amazon provides discovery advantage to books that are exclusive to them or that are published by them. They've created a caste system. Now, if we step back and we look at what's really happening in the world of publishing, um, this is a no growth market in the aggregate. The business of book publishing is not growing. If it's growing, it's growing very slowly. It's been flat for um, at least 10 years. And certainly um, a lot of indies have seen that the rapid exponential growth of the first few years is now a distant memory. Uh, the market for ebooks has pretty much gone flat. And so we have a problem here. We have um, more high quality, low cost books. Um, there's a glut of high quality, low cost books, more books than readers will ever possibly be able to read. And so with KDP Select, Amazon gets to decide which books are read. So they're giving narrow focus to books that are exclusive. Those books will do well in KDP Select. But authors who put their books in KDP Select are guaranteeing um, their inability to build a, a, a diverse um, network for their authors, a diverse revenue stream for their authors. You know, when you look at, at the, the impact that um, that Kindle Unlimited had on the market for authors um, at, at Amazon. Um, when it was introduced, I guess, almost a year and a half ago, um, 
a lot of authors saw their sales drop 50% or more instantly. And that's because Amazon provides uh, merchandising um, advantage to the books that are in, in Kindle Unlimited. Mm. The books in Kindle Unlimited are lower cost to Amazon. Their customers to, uh, to get the books for free through Kindle Unlimited, through a Kindle Unlimited subscription, than buying standalone copies. Mm. Um, so that it's good for the books that are in that program. Um, but it, it's not good for authors who are trying to earn a living selling standalone copies. And it's not good for authors who recognize that what Kindle Unlimited really represents. It represents um, Amazon stripping authors of pricing control. Because in Kindle Unlimited, the price of your, of your book doesn't matter at all. Mm. You know, Amazon decides what your book is worth to you, you know, what you deserve to be paid. So, you know, at first, um, when Amazon first launched Kindle, oh. author, based on readers reaching a certain threshold, 10%, and then it would trigger a full sale. So, authors of shorter works had a, a benefit there. Authors of longer works were disadvantaged. Now, they changed it <clears throat> to favor um, authors of longer works. They're paying by the page. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it disadvantages authors of shorter works, you know, um, so erotica authors, children's book authors, um, a lot of nonfiction authors are going to be disadvantaged under that system. And authors have no control over it. So, Amazon decides what you're going to be paid and nothing stops them from changing the rules again. Yeah, and if they follow the same pattern, then it's likely it starts really good and everyone's happy. And I know a lot of authors who have once again pulled all their books off every other vendor and gone back into select and uh, we'll see what happens by Christmas, I guess. But um, I don't want, I mean, I know many people listening will just have gone into select and we're not like having a go at authors, that's not what we're doing. But um, I agree with you. And I think I don't like, I hate trusting my entire income to one company. Like that's my fundamental belief is that you should never allow one company control over your in entire income. Um, I was laid off in 2008, along with a lot of other people in the global financial crisis. And I swore that I would never let that happen again. So that's my, the reason I know that I won't ever just be exclusive. But I did want to disagree with you on something. Um, you said that the uh, sales were flat. Now, I agree that they might be flat. Digital sales, ebook sales might be flat in the US, the UK, maybe Canada. But what I'm thinking about the next move is global. And, mm -hmm. you know, every month I'm seeing sales in more and more countries. You know, I have sold in 68 countries in English with through Kobo, through iBook. And so I'm seeing that the next growth is actually everywhere else in the world. And I know you've just um, published the formatting guide in Portuguese, so presumably mm -hmm. betting on Brazil. But what do you see for the next fundamental kind of growth spurt in digital on a, on a global scale? Well, I, I think there, I, I actually agree with you. There is tremendous opportunity on the global front. You know, for the last two years, 45% of our sales through iBooks have been outside the United States. Mm. And we are selling books into, um, you know, every one of their 51 countries every single day. And these are largely English language books. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about the global opportunity. And a lot of this global opportunity is going to um, be based on the mobile opportunity. Um, you know, five, six, seven years ago, the vast majority of entry level mobile phones were not ebook ready. But today, the vast majority of phones are smartphones. And so all of these phones are, um, you know, essentially bookstores in the pockets of readers. Um, you know, iBooks, Apple, Mm. bundles their 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 ebook store um, right on the home screen now of over one billion customers, one billion devices. Um, you know, I think about the opportunity in developing countries mm. um, where you know people get mobile phones before they get running water and electricity, and they now have access to books that just never would have been available to them before. Um, so yes, there's an opportunity. Globally, it's exciting, um, but I think most of the opportunity is still in the main 
English language countries for English language authors. So the US, Australia, UK, and Canada. And in these markets, you know, the markets are relatively mature. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, even though the market has gone flat, I think, in the aggregate, there's still tremendous opportunity for every author to break out and to do really well. It's, it's just that there's more competition than ever before. And, and that's okay. You know, it, it's really interesting when you think about it, back in the, in the, in the dark ages of <clears throat> print publishing, mm. publishers controlled the printing press. They decided which books were published. They decided which books went out of print. And most books went out of print very quickly. So there was a limited supply of books. And so now we're living in this age of abundance where books are ebooks are immortal. They never go out of print. They will forever occupy bookshelves, the virtual bookshelves, which means every single week you face more competition for your books. And that's both good and bad. It, it means that every author has a chance, but it means there's more competition. It means that... To stand out, you really need to implement all of the best practices, mm -hmm. and you need to be patient, and you need to work hard, and keep your expectations realistic, that this is a long-term journey. You know, I see so many authors who try publishing and give up after six months because they didn't sell well. It's really important for indies to understand that most indies don't sell well. And that's just the truth of the matter. We've always been upfront about that. Mm. Yeah, and you can, you know, like you said, I, th I think what you said at the beginning around creativity <coughs> and writing being the, 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 the end, uh, as it doesn't have to just be money. And I think that is really important. However, people listening are going, okay, you mentioned that authors can still break out and you mentioned some best practices. Now, Smash Oats has a number of free books that you've written around best practices, but maybe um, you could give us a couple of things that really do, that you've noticed that the breakout authors have done. Well, really the most important thing is the book. You know, I see a lot of authors putting um, attention into things that aren't really going to give them the biggest bang for the buck. And seven years ago, six years ago, you could write a mediocre book, price it at 99 cents, and you were going to reach a lot of readers because readers hadn't seen 99 cent books before. Um, but today, you know, I, j I, just, I just blogged about it uh, yesterday. Um, a few weeks ago, I heard from an author who had priced all his books at free and he wasn't reaching readers. Mm -hmm. So even free isn't enough to reach readers. It's all about the book. Good is not good enough anymore. Your book needs to take the reader to an emotionally satisfying extreme. The book needs to make the reader go, wow. You need to blow their mind because that's how you turn a reader into a super fan. That's how you turn a reader into an evangelist. That's how you trigger word of mouth. That's how one reader becomes two readers. Um, so that's really the most important thing. You need to aim to, you know, you need to write a five-star book. If you look at the bestsellers, they're getting five-star reviews, four and a half, five-star reviews. If you're earning three and a half stars, it's not good enough. You're not going to break out in a big way. So book quality, most important thing. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in broad distribution, broad, uninter uninterrupted distribution. So, you know, authors who followed my advice five years ago and maintain broad distribution everywhere um, are much more likely to be earning more outside of Amazon that, than at Amazon. So they are insulated with that diversification. If Amazon changes the algorithms again, um, these people aren't out of work. You know, they're not destroyed. Their business of publishing is not destroyed. Um, the cover image, I mean, you've talked about this a lot in the past. The cover image is just really important. So seven, eight years ago, most indies were creating their own cover images, and those images looked amateur. Um, today, I think most indies are using a professional to design their cover, but there are still indies who are not using professionals to design their own covers, so they will be disadvantaged. Mm. Um, there, there are new best practices, like... Um, pre-orders. I mean, we've found uh, very strong evidence that books that are born as a pre-order sell more copies than books that are just simply uploaded the day of release. Yet when we look at, at, at the books published at Smashwords in the last 12 months, over 90% of the books were just uploaded day of release. Less than 10% were uploaded as a pre-order, even though pre-orders account for two-thirds of our top 100 bestsellers. So, Authors who are doing pre-orders today, 
are getting a huge advantage. Um, and you know, I think the problem right now is a lot of authors don't know how to how to take full advantage of pre-orders. Um, but, you know, I'd refer them to Smashwords. I've written a bunch of blog posts on how to take the most advantage of, of pre-orders. So it's a great tool. Um, every author should be looking at their publishing schedule for the next 12 months and get everything up on pre-order today. Um, so that's that's a great tip. Mm. Um, you know, and, and then I would just say, you know, there, there are really dozens of best practices that authors need to be following. It's not about, you know, that single magic bullet. There is no single magic bullet. Um, you know, KDP Select is not the single magic bullet. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a, it's a temporary win for you, but it's not the long-term win. Mm. You know, even in KDP Select, if you want to be most successful, you want to take advantage of, you know, the dozens of other best practices. It's all about doing dozens of things right and avoiding those critical mistakes that will undermine you for the long term. Hmm. I, I want to come back on uh, pre-orders because I jumped in on pre-orders and I know obviously iBooks allows assetless pre-orders. You can <laughs> literally just put up a title, right? You don't even need a right. cover. You can even change the title later. I mean, you literally can just say, I could just say Arcane Book 9 and that's all and for a whole year. And also on Kobo, I believe it's a year as well. Um, and But for what we've seen, what author, the word on the street is um, on Amazon, there's almost no point in in doing um, pre-orders because you do, you know it splits your ranking over a long period. Whereas iBooks, you get double ranking. You get ranking when on the pre-orders, and then on on go live date, you get um, another ranking and a, a, a nice spike. So I mean, I'm almost thinking it's good to do pre-orders on Kobo and iBooks, but not on Amazon. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah. Um... I know a lot of Smashwords authors are deliberately not doing a pre-order at Amazon just for that reason, for fear that during that time that their book is available as pre-order, they're actually cannibalizing their first day's sales rank. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, yes, you are cannibalizing your first day's sales rank because all of those accumulated pre-orders don't credit mm. toward the first day's sales at Amazon. But, you know, although I could say, Yes, you know, no author should do a, a pre-order at Amazon. It's not that simple, because, um, you know, that 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 boost in in the sales rank that you get at iBooks and at Kobo, and to some extent at Barnes and Noble as well. Um, that's not the only benefit of pre-orders. So one of the most important benefits of a pre-order is that pre-orders enable more effective advanced marketing. So, you know, a lot of authors are working on their books and, and communicating with their fans on Facebook or, or on social media um, saying, hey, you know, this is the book I'm working on next. Um, it's coming out in six months, nine months. You're getting readers excited. Uh, you're building demand for your book. But if you don't have a pre-order, you have no way to capture um, that order at the moment you have the reader's attention and interest. Mm -hmm. And so I think this, you know, that benefit is still a huge benefit at Amazon. Um, you know, pre-orders are exciting to readers. You know, pre-orders allow you to, um, you know, allows the reader to imagine this wonderful book that you're going to come out with. Um, a pre-order communicates to your reader that you're making a commitment. Like, I think a series with follow-on pre-orders is more desirable than a series without the follow-on pre-orders because you're making a commitment to the reader that you're committed to the series and you've got more books coming. Um, you know, we know that pre-orders sell more copies. Um, you know, even though you give up that accumulated sales rank on day one at Amazon, um, you can still rank if you're, you know, during that pre-order period based on the number of orders that you're getting. Hmm. Um, and you're helping to ensure that the first readers to get your books um, are the first readers to review. And the people who place a pre-order are most likely to be one of your fans already. They already trust you. Um, and so the first round of reviews that you get will be from your most ardent fans. So there, there are a lot of, a lot of benefits of doing the pre-order uh, beyond that, that sales rank jump. Mm. Just wrote down uh, an idea about a pre-order. So thank you for that. It's always good to, yeah. to, to think about it in a, a different way. Um, and, uh, you know, every author is going to need to make the decision for themselves. Like if, if you don't have a built-up platform already, then, you know, the pre-order may not help you very much mm -hmm. at Amazon. Um, if you don't have the ability to do effective advanced marketing, then it may not help you as much. 
Hmm. Yeah, there are always pros and cons. Um, I yeah. do I do want to ask you, you mentioned Barnes & Noble there and, and Nook. I've been very upset with Nook because obviously, um, well, one, I stopped using Nook Press because it's just it just wasn't working and it was breaking, which if people don't know is their own self-publishing platform. And then they, they uh, cancelled all of their international Nook stores except for the UK. So there's only the US and the UK now. And I believe they've said that they're not going to do any more Nook devices. I think that, don't quote me on that, everybody. But um, what do you think is happening with Nook? Well, you know, people have been proclaiming the death of Barnes & Noble ever since I started Smashwords. (laughs) And yet it has consistently been our second largest sales channel, you know, from the moment we started distributing to them. Um, Every author should be at Barnes & Noble. You should get your books back in Barnes & Noble. Oh, no, they uh-huh. are. My books okay. are in Barnes & Noble. Okay, good. But all right, it's good. just like, you know, it's, they're just a pain. And when they canceled all the international stores after talking to me here about international sales, I was like, what is going on there? Is, you know, by pulling back, aren't they demonstrating, you know, something bad? <laughs> well, you know, they are struggling. You know, and, and anyone who's competing against... Amazon is struggling right now. Um, and, you know, Barnes & Noble has, you know, given themselves some self-inflicted wounds. Um, so, yeah, it was disappointing that they pulled back on their, on their international aspirations. Um, but my sense is that they're still committed mm. to ebooks. And, you know, I, I think we all need to be hoping and rooting that they succeed. It would be a big loss if we lost them. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, it, it, it would be a big loss to the community if we lost them. Um, you know, it, I, I've heard about the struggles with Nook Press. You know, most of our authors use Smashwords yeah. <laughs> to deliver to Barnes & Noble. It's really much easier. Mm. Uh, you know, there's an idea out there among some authors that you should go direct everywhere you can. Um, but I don't believe that. And, uh, and you know, it's difficult for me to separate my self-interest, you know, in this argument. Of course. But, <laughs> of course. I, but, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, you know, I, it doesn't really matter what happens to me or it doesn't matter what happens to Smashwords. I really do care about what's in the best interest of mm-hmm. authors and the author community. Your unique contribution to the world as an author is your writing. And, yes, you can upload directly to a lot of different platforms. And yes, it's relatively easy. It's not difficult. Um, But it is time consuming to manage multiple platforms, especially once you've got multiple books. Hmm. You know, if you want to update the back matter of 10 books at four or five different platforms, you're talking about hours of work. Hmm. But if you've consolidated your distribution with a distributor, um, you're talking about a few minutes of work. And that's more time that you can spend writing, more time you can spend, you know, fighting for that work-life balance, spending time with your friends and family. You know, I don't know a single author, you know, who has too many hours in the day. And, <laughs> or, and, or many people. <laughs> right, right, or many people. And, um, you know, it's really, it, it's a, in my mind, it's kind of a, a no-brainer. You, you give up a little bit in, um, in royalty, but not much. You know, the difference between uploading to Barnes & Noble and Smashwords, you're only giving up 5% of the list price, and at price points under two ninety nine or over nine ninety nine, you actually earn about 50% more with Smashwords. So, um, you know, it, it's, I, 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 think, I think it's dangerous, um, th- this idea that you need to upload direct everywhere you can. I, I know what the average author earns. I see it. And the average author does not earn very much. The average author you know, is wasting a lot of time that they could um, be better could be better spent writing. And even among bestsellers, mm-hmm. you know, you could argue that a bestseller's time is even more valuable and it's more important for that bestseller to be focused on the next book rather than managing multiple platforms. Mm-hmm. And I see authors who achieve success and they end up hiring, you know, teams, assistants yeah. to manage all the uploading. And, you know, that's really... I mean, it's great if you can afford to hire a team, but it's really not necessary if you simplify um, your life and manage your time properly. 
Mm. So um, just going back to what's happening with the platforms, what, another change we've seen recently is iBooks having the audiobooks on the same screen, which I'm like, yeah, brilliant. I've been waiting for that. It's ridiculous that the, I, the audiobooks have been separated from the iBooks and now they're integrated. Um, so do you, what do you see with audiobooks and, um, you know, is that exciting? Is Smashwords interested in that arena? And do you see that um, iBooks will be a bigger challenger to um, Amazon in terms of the Audible play, for example? Well, um, Amazon has monopolistic control over the audiobook market. There really isn't any other player that matters. And, and we've seen um, what happens when Amazon gets control over a market, how they just absolutely gutted royalty rates for audiobook authors. Um, and they've locked up a lot of distribution channels exclusively. Um, so there's not, it, it, it would be difficult for a challenger to come along and offer an alternative. Um, we have had many Smashwords authors come to us and actually beg us to get into audiobooks mm. and offer an alternative. I mean, the authors are just so upset that Amazon gets to determine what the price of their book is, mm. gets to determine what they pay them, um, and, and, you know, authors spending thousands of dollars to produce these books and then having all that control taken away from them. Um, you know, I just heard a story, uh, an author emailed me a couple of weeks ago. She said that her narrator for her audio book, you know, she had originally, the narrator did the first books in her series, um, you know, royalty by split. taking a cut, a mm -hmm. royalty split. Yeah. Well, now the narr narrator said, I'm not going to take a royalty split anymore because of, you know, what Amazon's done to yeah. the royalties. I'm hearing um, that you, too. You're gonna need to pay me up front. And so I you know, I I yeah, I think there's an opportunity with audiobooks. Um, you know, it's something that we kind of have in the back of our minds. You know, we see how we could disrupt that space potentially. Um, so I who knows? We'll see what happens in the future. Um, I still feel like there's a greater opportunity for us to continue building on what we've built on the ebook space. But mm. never say never. Never say never. Yeah, and I think if anyone's going to challenge um, Audible, it has to be iTunes. I mean, it, it has to be. It's the only other kind of big audio platform um, right now. Uh, the only other one being Google Play. Um, now, we know that there's massive problems with the Google Play ebook arena which is why most authors don't even do it because of their discounting right. issues um, right. do you see any change coming with with google play because they would seem to be an obvious challenger to amazon well they are an obvious challenger to amazon you know both they and apple you know those are the two com companies that can afford to make no money mm. on books <laughs> and still stay in business those are the only two business only two companies um you know, I've been in communication with Google since the very beginning. Uh, have many, many productive discussions with them. Um, they are just an entirely different beast. They feel very strongly that um, that agency pricing, you know, authors setting their own pricing, is bad. Um, they don't see. I, I I don't see them ever abandoning the wholesale model. Mm -hmm. um, and they they. Their approach to the ebook market is just completely different and, you know, mind boggling to a lot of us. You know, they've, it, uh, it's like they've really got their hands tied um, in, in their ability to engage with authors and publishers. Um, oh, right. So, you, so it, you're not seeing that as something immediate that's going to get fixed because, of course, they've closed their publishing stuff now. But I don't know why, you know, problems with piracy and whatever. Um, and I've kind of given up on that for now. But do you, I was thinking it would only be a month or so and then it might be back. But from what you're saying, maybe not. Well, I, I think it will be back. Um, but you never, you never know. You know, Google is a really big company. And, um, you know, it remains to be seen if they stay committed to books or not. Mm. Uh, I think they really felt burned by the response of the publishing industry when when Google was doing all the book oh, scanning. Yeah, the scanning, yeah. And, you know, it created a lot of legal troubles for them. And, mm. uh, you know, I, in the grand scheme of things, I don't know if it's, um, if long term they're going to see it as a viable opportunity. Um, you know, for now, they do. For now, they appear very committed to it. Um, I hope, 
I hope they stay committed to it. I, I hope they, they get the formula right. Um, I hope they figure out a way to accommodate authors, accommodate distributors like Smashwords. I know we've got tens of thousands of authors who are dying to have their books available in Google Play. It would be good for Google. It would be good for our authors. It would be good for ensuring a dynamic competitive ecosystem of multiple retail options for authors. Um, but, it, you know, it's obviously been frustrating as well that, it, you know, frust frustrating for you and frustrating for every indie author. Mm -hmm. um, you know, indie authors want control over their work. Indie authors want to be able to price their own work, as they should. It, it is the indie author's right to decide what their book should be sold at, in my opinion. Um, but Google sees it a little bit differently right now. Mm. And then I, I had a bit of an idea about, um, I had a, um, a lady on la last week's show, <laughs> Ricky from Free Booksy, who um, is awesome. And we were talking about Facebook. And I was like, you know, with Mark Zuckerberg, with his year of books, we've got internet.org, which is what Facebook is bringing the internet to the world. They're also going to do a cheap phone for all those global markets where Facebook is the browser. Um, they've also added the, the notes function back in, so native blogging. Do you see Facebook going? into native publishing they they could they could if they wanted and that would be very disruptive if they did that's um, what i think too and often with his year yeah. of whatever you know zuckerberg has shown his commitment to books i think um in in the books he's choosing are just kind of crazy heavy books um so yeah i mean that's kind of my interesting pick out of nowhere for 2016. <laughs> yeah i think that's a fun prediction um i i you know i i would like to see them do mm. something in books. I think it would be really interesting. Um, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg is a fan of books. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as many business leaders are, you know, books are amazing for anyone who's got a brain. Um, <laughs> you know, whether you enjoy fiction or nonfiction, people with brains love books. And, and he's a smart guy. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it is certainly a tremendous opportunity for him to um, spread the joy of, of literature and, the, uh, and reading to, you know, billions of people. Yeah, that is, uh, I think that's going to be very interesting. So um, I want you to tell everybody uh, a bit more about what they can find at Smashwords if people are not on Smashwords. Um, you know, why would an author, obviously you've talked about the ease of uploading to multiple platforms at the same time. What are the other reasons people might choose Smashwords and why would they choose it over draft to digital for example? Well, you know, Smashwords is the world's largest distributor of self-published books. We've been doing it for almost eight years now. Um, we've built a really slick platform that makes it fast, free, and easy to self-publish an ebook, to control that book, and to get that book distributed to multiple stores, including stores that you can't reach on your own, that you can't upload direct to. Um, we've invested a lot of effort into building exciting tools that help make your book more available, more discoverable, more desirable to readers. Uh, the pre-order tool, the assetless pre-order tool that we announced a couple months ago, huge development effort. <clears throat> um, tools for enhanced metadata. So we've got a tool called Series Manager that makes book series, all the books in a series, more discoverable at the retailers. Um, so that's a really powerful tool. Um, we, we distribute to public libraries. Uh, we work with Overdrive, Baker & Taylor, Access 360. So we're giving you access to over 20,000 public libraries around the world. Um, and we'll be announcing another library partner here in the next couple months. So um, we also operate our own store, which is a little bit unusual for a distributor. You know, we started as a store and then entered distribution in 2009. Um, we sell quite a few books at our store. So even if you have no interest in reaching our retailers, um, you should have your book at Smashwords. There's no cost. It's easy. You can upload a Word doc. You can upload an EPUB and sell in our store. Our store offers the highest royalty rates of any of the stores. You can earn up to 80% list. So why not? You know, it'll help you reach readers that you're not going to reach anywhere else. Um, but, you know, whether an author works with us or not, I hope they take advantage of our best practices materials. Um, you know, all of the all three of the books that I've written are available for free. They've been downloaded uh, over seven hundred thousand times, and you know, I want people to take 
take my advice, take my guidance, and use it, even if you don't use it at Smashwords, um, because um, you know a rising tide is going to lift all boats. I want to I want to see you know every author in the world achieve their their greatest aspirations, mm -hmm. and um, and and it really all comes down to best practices. Uh, there's nothing more important than best practices. So just tell people the titles of, of those books that sure. you have available for free, right, on Smash. Right, Every, yeah, everything's free. Uh, so three, three books that you should take a look at. There's the Smashword Style Guide, so that's how to format and publish an e-book. Um, the Secrets to e-book uh, Publishing Success. Uh, this book identifies about 31 best practices of the best-selling indie authors. So mm -hmm. these are their secrets, all that's of the secrets. Book. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, inspired by your fellow indie authors. Indie authors are pioneering the secrets to success. And so they're all on that book. Um, and then the Smashwords Book Marketing Guide um, provides about 40 uh, ideas for marketing your book, your ebook, your print book. And all of these ideas are free to implement. And some of them only take a few minutes to implement and you'll get long term benefit. So, yeah, those are the three books. You can check them out. And, uh, and then, you know, at the Smashwords blog, um, I'll often blog about, you know, new stuff that's not even in my books yet. And, um, you know, stuff that I'm talking about in the talks that I do around the country, mm. uh, you know, based on what I'm observing of what's working, what's not. Yeah, and they're fantastic. And you do great slide shares as well. And yeah, your, your blog is, I always, I'm always tweeting your blog posts because they're... Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, you've, no, they're great. Joanna, you've been such an awesome supporter of the indie author movement. And I appreciate everything you do to help educate authors to be to become professional publishers so thank oh, you well what's no, so great is no i mean we're going to know each other for a long time i hope mark and every, i hope so yeah and it's just we're just seeing so much change uh, so uh, obviously hopefully people will know where to find you but just in case where can people find you online well um you can email me mc at smashwords.com um you can follow me on twitter at mark coker I'm on Facebook. Just search for me at Facebook. Um, and then I'm at Smashwords, of course. You can sign up for an account at Smashwords at smashwords.com. It's very simple. Um, check out my blog. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Mark. That was great. Thanks, Joanna.